Welcome to Overlooked. My name is Yemi, and I'll be your host for the show. Released weekly, I share Overlooked stories from around the world with you. This will include the good, the bad, the weird, and sometimes the absolutely hilarious. Come back often, share with your friends, and feel free to add the podcast to your regular podcast rotation, wherever you get your podcasts. If you come across stories or articles that you think should be featured here, please don't hesitate to share them. Now, it's time for this week's episode. Hi everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hope you're all having a great week. One of these stories, and spoiler alert, is the last story, really sparked off some debate in my own circle. Emotions were high and passions flirt. I'll let you know when we get there, and until we do, let's start this week's episode with an update to a story that we covered on this podcast before. In the first episode that was released in June, and that will be episode 17. Wow, that feels so long ago, doesn't it? In that episode, one of the stories we covered was on a mining company, Rio Tinto, that destroyed a sacred 46,000-year-old cave in order to mine iron ore. These caves were called Jukan Gorge, and they had been located in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. There was, understandably, a lot of controversy. It was widely reported at the time that the demolition went ahead with approvals from the government, but the approvals were prior to the discovery of any ancient artifacts. According to the BBC, there was abundant evidence that the company was well aware of the site's importance before blasting it. Fast forward to the present day. The chief executive, Jean Sebastien Jacques, and two other senior executives are now leaving the company, as the company has now tried to quell public anger over the destruction of Jukan Gorge. Rio Tinto has affirmed its commitment to never destroying a heritage site with an exceptional archaeological or cultural significance ever again. Some advocacy groups in Australia welcomed the decision. However, the Putu Kunti, Kurama, and Pinikura Aboriginal Corporation released a statement saying that their people had no comment on the executive shakeup, but they plan to continue to work with the company towards pushing for cultural change. According to researchers, a 113 square kilometer sheet of ice has broken away from the Arctic's largest remaining ice shelf. For some context, the size of the ice that broke off is larger than the city of Paris. Okay, okay, let's pause here. Dear listeners, you folks already know I make every effort to pronounce names that I am unfamiliar with. I'm a trooper just like that. I may butcher the name, but I will try. So this time is going to be slightly different. First, I will try to pronounce it. But what I'll do this time is have Google pronounce it after I do. The name of the glacier is Neogatsflitsfjorden. Neogatsflitsfjorden. If there are any Danish people listening, please send a voice note on social media pronouncing it, and I will share with the rest of the class. Okay, let's unpause and get back to the story. The glacier is in northeast Greenland, and it shows the huge slab of ice having broken away last month and splintering into smaller fragments. According to Sky News, the fractured area itself is a northern tributary called Splate Glacier, and it's been under the watchful eye of scientists for years as increasingly warm temperatures led to its gradual degradation. According to Science Alert, it is normal for pieces of ice to break off from a glacier in a process called calving. The pieces are generally not this large though. This is what is raising concerns, the size of the piece that broke off. Scientists at the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland have said that since 1999, the glacier has lost 160 square kilometers of ice, an area twice the size of Manhattan in the United States, with the loss rates having accelerated over the past two years. Researchers have conducted a successful first flight of Flying V. Flying V is a futuristic and fuel-efficient airplane that could one day carry passengers on its wing. The plane's design is unique for sure. It has a V shape rather than the shape we're all used to. In this new design, the passenger cabin, the cargo hold, and the fuel tanks are in the wings rather than in the central body of the plane. Experts hope that a plane's aerodynamic shape will cut fuel consumption by 20% compared to today's aircrafts. The aircraft was tested by a team of researchers and engineers in Germany, and they worked with Airbus and the partner airline KLM. 
There is still work to be done to refine the aircraft before it could take to the skies with passengers aboard. Experts plan to use the data collected from the test flight for an aerodynamic model of the plane, allowing them to program it in a flight simulator for future tests and to improve flights. I think it looks pretty cool. As I've said in previous episodes, I personally don't like the airplane experience. I just like to, you know, arrive. When there's teleportation, stable teleportation, I'll be one of those that probably sign up. Google has now said that its carbon footprint is down to zero, wiping out its entire carbon footprint by investing in carbon offsets. According to the company, they became carbon neutral in 2007, but this year, they have effectively erased all the carbon footprints that they ever created. That is a really bold and interesting claim. Google says it is now purchasing enough high-quality carbon offsets to neutralize all emissions released since it was founded. It is one of several large technology companies that has committed to reducing or eliminating carbon use. Chief Executive Mr. Pichai said Google pledges to be using only carbon-free energy by the year 2030. They also plan to help other companies and even cities to operate more sustainably. Federal prosecutors from the United States have charged two Iranian nationals on charges of hacking into American computer networks, stealing data for both personal and financial gain, and stealing this data at the behest of the Iranian government. According to documents that list the charges, the defendants targeted universities, defense contractors, foreign policy organizations, non-governmental organizations, and countries where individuals identified as rivals or adversaries to Iran included Saudi Arabia and Israel. The prosecutors accused Human Haidaran and Mehdi Farti of selling the stolen data on the black market and to the Iranian government. The U.S. Justice Department said that the data stolen included sensitive information on national security, nuclear information, personal financial information, and intellectual property. According to the indictment, both men had been operating since at least the year 2013. Of course, the charges and allegations contained in the indictment are mere accusations, and the defendants are considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. The double Olympic 800-meter champion, Casta Semenya, appears to have lost her long-running legal battle against regulations that require women who have high testosterone levels to take suppressing medication in order to compete internationally in distances that range between 400 meters and one mile. Switzerland Supreme Court said its judges dismissed Semenya's appeal against a ruling by the Court of Arbitration for Sports last year that affects athletes with differences in sex development, or DSD. The court said the ruling was necessary, reasonable, and proportionate to ensure fair competition in women's sport. Semenya, now 29, has hyperandrogenism, a genetic condition that makes her body produce higher levels of testosterone than the average female. Testosterone is a hormone that most women have in much smaller amounts than men, and it is associated with stronger performance in sports. In its artificial form, testosterone is part of the World Anti-Doping Agency's list of banned substances. This ruling now means that she cannot defend her Olympic 800-meter title at the Tokyo Games or compete in any other top meets in distances that range from 400 meters to a mile unless she agrees to lower her testosterone level through medication or surgery. She has repeatedly said she will not do that. Many athletics argue that hyperandrogenism offers her an unfair advantage on the track. Others have said that the stance of world athletics is harmful to the sport overall. I'm interested to know what the listeners think about it. On one hand, she was born that way. And on the other hand, it has made us stronger and faster than those who do not have a condition like she does. To me, it's like saying someone who is really tall should not do hurdles because they have longer legs. Oscar Pistorius was an athlete. Among other things, I will not get into those, you know what I'm talking about. But just focusing on his athletic career, he was a South African who ran with prosthetics. At first, he wasn't allowed to perform on ground that he had an unfair advantage because of his prosthetic legs. He appealed and successfully then performed in both Olympics and Paralympics. I don't mind having rules that aim for fairness. I just think that they need to be applied consistently. And that's my opinion. What do you guys think? 
23-year-old Baraka Safari Eli has made rechargeable irons, the first of its kind in the Democratic Republic of Congo. His irons are rechargeable and are able to conserve energy for up to three hours. Young Safari Eli says he wants to help improve the lives of Congolese people in a country where electricity is a problem. The rechargeable irons cost $25 and many Congolese have already shown interest in this made in Congo product. In our last story for this episode, and yes, this is the one that had a lot of debate. An Australian woman who received the lottery ticket as a birthday gift from her husband has now discovered that the ticket has turned her into a millionaire. The ticket was worth nearly 3 million Australian dollars. Apparently, when he gave her the ticket, he told her that the ticket would make her very happy. He was right, right in almost 3 million ways. I'm just glad it was her spouse and not a friend that got her the ticket. And can you imagine giving a friend a lottery ticket and it turns out to be a multi-million dollar ticket? Yeah, that's what the debate was. Essentially what we were debating is, if you were a friend that gave someone a lottery ticket for their birthday and it turns out that the ticket was worth $3 million, would you want to cut out that money? Or would you say, you know what, I gave it to you, have at it. Let me know what you guys think. Having said that, Congratulations to you, Mrs. Anonymous Australian Woman. And this brings us to the end of this episode. I really feel it goes by so fast. Anyway, have yourselves a great week. Thanks for listening, friends. As a reminder, the podcast is released weekly. Subscribe or follow across social media to be notified when a new episode is released. Overlooked is a Tunuka Media production, which also includes shows like Africa in My Kitchen, with more on the way. Follow Tunuka Media on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter to connect to say hi, or to be on the forefront of upcoming shows and program schedules. Until next time, I'm your host, Yemi.